introduction reminded me of uh, an introduction I made of Dr. Henry Kissinger one time in New York. Uh, it was a very small gathering, probably about four tables of maybe eight people each, and they all knew him. So I trotted that line out, and he came to the mic and he said, well, I said, well, it's true that I need to do an introduction. No one enjoys it more than I do. <laughs> Glad you went on and published this. I appreciate it. Um, first of all, some thank yous to Sarah Suggs at the San Diego Connor Institute, Dave Brown at the Valley Leadership. Uh, the, I don't know if we still have some elected leaders here today, but to the to the Valley uh, leadership generally, uh, what a great cause to help develop the leadership that our state needs in the future. And there is no area in which that leadership is going to be more important than the general subject of water and what usually it, uh, turns out to be a question about uh, some kind of uh, shortage of water that we need to deal with. Clearly this is going to be a, a great future for a lot of lawyers who want to go into that subject in the future. I commend that to you and uh, seriously for the leaders who uh, serve in any other capacity here it will uh, stand you in good stead understand some of the basics and so I'm going to talk just a little bit about that today. You heard from the discussion this morning of course <clears throat> that the Colorado River is in trouble and we get a, a pretty good proportion I think maybe around 40 percent of our water from the Colorado River so that's important to the state of Arizona. We've been trying to figure out a way with our other with the other states that also use Colorado River water to share the shortage well, as you can imagine, sharing the shortage is not a fun thing to try to do. But um, we've uh, had underway for some time now a group of people who are working on what they call a drought contingency plan for the DCP, uh, which would uh, apply to all of the lower basin areas in California, Nevada, and Arizona. And the reports that I've received uh, back in Washington, D.C. are that uh, while there are still difficulties and there are details to be ironed up among the various stakeholders, that uh, they are much closer to reaching consensus. And I commend them for this because I know how difficult that is. And so I really thank all of you who have been working on this. Um, I, I know, for example, Governor Lewis is here, and the Hill River Indian community has been a, a great uh, factor in trying to move things along. So I thank you for that. Um, and I also uh, wanted to suggest that there is a federal role here, and uh, the whatever we whatever is adopted by the state of Arizona, and the legislature will have to act on it, <coughs> will form the basis for federal legislation that will then direct the Secretary of Interior to implement the drought contingency plan that the three basin states and the four upper basin states have devised. That legislation we had hoped to have ready for introduction and passage in the lame duck session that we're currently in. It appears that because some issues in California have yet to be resolved, at least the last I heard they had, and uh, we're still wrapping up the negotiations here in Arizona and the fact that we've got a very short period of time left in the lame duck session of the 115th Congress that Probably that legislation will have to be introduced early next year. But um, as long as we can reach a consensus, we can move forward together. And again, I want to thank all those who worked so hard about it on that. What I would rather talk about today, since I've not been directly involved in those discussions, but uh, which pertains to the question of leadership, uh, is to talk about the last time that Arizona attempted a sweeping change in water law. You saw it in the film that was presented to you earlier, the time leading up to the passage of the 1980 Groundwater Act. <clears throat> the uh, Senator Dale O'Connor Institute and Valley Leadership are dedicated to cultivating leadership and building consensus to address today's problems that are facing Arizona. And the story of the Groundwater Management Act, I think, is a shining example of both leadership and consensus building on one of the most challenging policy issues that our states ever faced. So I think it's a good case study to just take a look at for a couple minutes here to uh, potentially, uh, again, interest you more in the study of the subject of water to be a leader in that as we go forward. 
in the documentary that Kathy Ferris presented earlier, you heard the story about the depletion of Arizona's groundwater aquifers, and uh, that that was really one of the reasons for the uh, Central Arizona project being conceived and eventually passed and funded and built, because we knew that the water supply by the Salt River project, while very valuable to Central Arizona, and the groundwater pumping that we were doing uh, was satisfying the needs of the time, it soon wouldn't be enough. Arizona was simply growing too fast. And by the late 1970s, uh, we saw the water table in Arizona had declined uh, at least 500 feet. And it was becoming more and more expensive uh, to, for the electricity to run the pumps to pump that water from such deep, deep depths. Some farms actually had been abandoned because the aquifers beneath them had dried up. And there were actually, in Pinal County in particular, large fissures in the land where uh, subsidence in the earth had, had uh, uh, created these large cracks. Uh, Tucson, which uh, at the time uh, was about a half a million of growing and was the largest city in the United States solely dependent upon groundwater for its uh, uh, water needs, um, was obviously in a uh, position that they needed to think of something to help get them off of the groundwater totally. And I'll always be grateful to Morris Udall, who actually sold the people of Tucson on the idea of taking Central Arizona Project of water. They, their water was so good, coming from the pumps that, that they had from the groundwater, uh, they didn't want the dirty CAP water. That, and when, the, when it first came out, they didn't have the right kind of water treatment. I remember it was kind of brown and smelly. They didn't like it one bit, and they, they were kind of mad that Udall brought out very grateful talk them into it. They figured out a way to treat the water like they do up here. It's, it's fine now. But it was clear that Arizona was, was looking at a crisis if we didn't do something about our water usage. Uh, the CAP, uh, in some regards, was considered the rescue project for the state of Arizona because it would be a large renewable source of water, uh, as one person uh, said, that would keep us from drowning in sand. Uh, and just to make that a, a put this in historical context, this uh, potential overdraft of groundwater was not new in the 1970s. As far back as the 1930s, state leaders and water experts had understood that we'd have to do something about the pumping. In the 1940s, the Secretary of the Interior warned Arizona that the Central Arizona Project wouldn't even be built unless we created some kind of groundwater reform here in the state. And so legislators and leaders tried in the 40s and 50s uh, they made repeated attempts at figuring out how to do a groundwater regulation regime, but the only laws they passed were toothless and uh, uh, really nothing more than the foundation for future legislation, as they called it. So in effect, they kicked the can down the road, and uh, in a way, who could blame them? Because regulation of or, and ma management of water among competing users is a very difficult thing to accomplish. But Finally, in 1968, uh, the CAP was authorized, and it actually conditioned the allocations of CAP water to users in the state of Arizona on some kind of uh, groundwater management uh, to deal with this problem of overdraft. Now, there were obviously practical reasons for this. I say obvious, it, maybe it wasn't obvious, but CAP water was going to be fairly expensive weren't used to having to pay so much for water. Even more expensive, some calculated, than the high costs of electricity for pumping. Uh, and so there were those who were, who were uh, uh, reluctant for that reason to put so much effort into the groundwater management. But um, a second reason was that the claims that Arizona's Indian tribes had historically had Finally, they were beginning to assert in water adjudication or litigation, and it was clear that we were going to have to have additional sources of water if all of the potential users were going to be satisfied at least to the maximum extent possible. So CAP construction finally got underway. Arizona still hadn't gotten serious about groundwater management reform, and that's where the movie that Kathy Fair showed you that kind of kicked in. Um, when the allocations by the Secretary of the Interior to the various entities that had applied for CAP water 
were supposed to be made, Governor Babbitt at the time convinced Secretary Agris to delay it and to make the point to Arizonans again that if you don't get about ground, groundwater management reform here, uh, I'm not going to make these allocations, or I might make them in a way that you might not like. Now, as you saw in the movie or the film, uh, that was more of a bluff than, than a reality, but it had an effect, and it did cause people to focus on the need to, to, to work on this. So the first thing they did was establish a groundwater management study commission, and uh, that was primarily by the legislature. There were 24 members of the, of the state legislature on it, the rest were representatives of the major users, the utilities, the mines, the agricultural communities, and the cities and towns in the state. Uh, the commission tried to meet, as all commissions do, very publicly and very transparently, and nothing got done because people didn't want to put all their cards on the table uh, when the whole world was watching, and they weren't about to make any kind of deals because their various constituencies <laughs> wouldn't like it. So they were not able to resolve their disagreements in that public setting. Uh, they all had legitimate objections to limiting their groundwater pumping. It's fine if yours was limited, but mine is sacrosanct. So, uh, still, they had, uh, and you can understand this, everybody had made significant investments in, in pumps and in delivery systems and in infrastructure to withdraw in the third round. And for another, the privilege of drilling a well and supplying water to a parcel of land was considered part of the value of the land. Clearly, it did contribute to the value of the land. And so groundwater reform threatened those investments and it threatened the assets that people had in the land that they owned, in which they were drawing water. Management obviously would fundamentally disrupt all of this. And although groundwater pumping did entail expensive costs, as I said. CAP supplies were deemed to be more expensive, so what the heck, we'll just keep on uh, enjoying the groundwater we have. That was kind of the mindset at that period of time. Nobody wanted to sign up for the more expensive water, and they didn't want to give up their right to pump. So, impasse, the battle, and a couple of the legislative leaders decided that maybe it was time to do some business in a way that, at least at that time, uh, business was conducted in the state legislature. The will be nine closed doors. I don't know if they lit up any big cigars, but they took off their coats and rolled up their sleeves and sat down in what they called a rump group. You saw it in the film. And that group, I actually was a, a participant in that, and met at least weekly for about nine months uh, until a consensus was actually developed. It was very interesting that there were times when it appeared it would never happen. I want to commend Governor Babbitt for his leadership <coughs> because he mastered the subject and conducted uh, meetings uh, with a very firm hand. And he had a great staffer at the time, Kathy Ferris, who uh, <laughs> kept coming up with bright ideas. Uh, and uh, honestly, she did come up with quite a big bright idea that, uh, that I think put it over the top. Uh, the active management areas that would require cities to ensure that there was a 100-year water supply and a new development within their city limits was a key component of this. It was already agreed that agriculture would have to limit putting new land into production, and there were other limitations that applied. So a lot of sacrifices were made by these various uh, water users, and they probably, in fact, I will just say, they could not have been made uh, had the whole public and all of their constituencies been watching because I just don't think that those constituents would have allowed their representatives to make the deals that they ultimately made. I know um, I represented agricultural interests. I was uh, pretty concerned when we were all done that agriculture had gotten a short end of the stick. At the end of the day, I think <coughs> the compromises were very good, and looking back now in hindsight, I can tell you I think we made the right decisions. And I think agriculture, by the way, uh, has done just fine. But all sides felt that they had to fight as strongly as they possibly could. And uh, to make deals, sometimes you have to do it outside of the public view. Uh, this is uh, one of the first things that I want to mention when I uh, talk about lessons learned, and I'll get to that in just a moment. I, I did want to just briefly describe some of the compromises that were made so you'll have a little better idea of the nature of the controversies and 
what came out of that in terms of public policy that still exists today. As I said, first on agriculture, existing use was grandfather, but we prohibited new irrigated agriculture within these active management areas. Both mining and other industries were given a means of securing permits for groundwater withdrawals. In the past, they were having to fight with other uh, groundwater users to <coughs> group from the same aquifer. Uh, cities were able to use some groundwater, but the 100-year water supply uh, was imposed on future development, which meant that there had to be a renewable source of water. And given the fact that this aquifer depletion was not considered a renewable uh, uh, water use, obviously we had to have a, a surface water uh, source of some kind, and that was the CDP water, renewable every year if it snowed enough in the mountains. All of the sectors in Arizona were subject to various conservation and efficiency standards under the Act. It's one of the reasons that uh, Arizona has one of the best records in the country for conserving water. We can still do a little bit more on reusing water, but uh, we've actually been quite good in the conservation department. Um, and I would also just make this point, if you're wondering how much this really matters, consider where Arizona would be without that Groundwater Management Act. I think it's possible that at least um, it, it's possible that the Secretary of Interior might have made good on his threat at some point and refused to allocate CAP water. It was his to allocate, and but until he did, he didn't have the right to accept delivery. It would also be difficult to imagine how Maricopa and Pinal and Pima counties um, would have fared without that supply, given the fact that it's at least 40% of the supply in many of the places in those counties today. Um, some places might well have drowned in sand, as I don't time to put it. What if a new administration had perhaps been persuaded to go through with the CAP allocations, even without groundwater uh, regulation? Would Phoenix and Tucson have continued to attract economic development? And would Central Arizona have continued to thrive? So I think that was the real threat. It wasn't that the Secretary of uh, Interior was going to play games with his legal authority. But rather, Chamber of Commerce, people who were looking at the future, uh, understood that Arizona wouldn't sell so well if the headlines of the New York Times were water crisis in Arizona. We had to solve our problems for everyone here to thrive. That was the real impetus, and it's what finally I think drove us all to the table. Um, it is clear that the CAP has been a large part of the success of Arizona's since uh, water began being delivered. But it's also clear to me that without the groundwater regulation, uh, we might uh, still be facing crises that would be even more difficult to resolve than the ones that we're currently facing. <coughs> yes, we have a crisis with the DCP, uh, with the necessity of the drought contingency plan to deal with the fact that we are in a long sustained drought, We're just not getting as much snowpack as well as rain on the Rocky Mountains, it eventually flows into the Colorado River. <laughs> um, but that's something that we always knew could happen, and therefore, this is the time to get the planning done to resolve those issues in the future, so that if the worst does come to worst, we thought about it in advance and figured out a way to resolve the problem so that we don't see those headlines in the New York Times in the future. Uh, I think that the, that the Groundwater Management Act really signaled Arizona's commitment to ensuring that we would only grow based on renewable water supplies. And that's one reason why when people have always asked our leaders, well, what about water in Arizona? We've been able to say, no problem. We've planned for the future. Yeah, we don't get much of it in the way of rain, but we have, we understand what it is to do without it, to have to manage it, and we've done that. Um, and also, I, just a, a, another point, to the cities. <clears throat> there was a time in Arizona's history where uh, developers uh, sold land without water, and a lot of people lost a lot as a result of that. And this was partly an answer to that phenomenon as well. The cities were not going to allow development unless we could be assured that at least for 100 years there's enough water to take care of the people who, who bought that. And uh, I think you saw in the documentary Ron Rayner, a longtime farmer. And I'm quoting uh, here, he said, the retrospective groundwater act really was good for agriculture, as I said. 
because it gave farmers a quantified, grandfathered right to use groundwater for irrigation, and in the end, it sustained agriculture for decades longer than otherwise would have been the case. So all of the major interests gave something up, but they all got something too. And the state of Arizona and all the rest of us were the big winners because they were able to compromise. So what were some of the lessons uh, here? Um, first of all, put everything in context. We strive for transparency in our public policy debates today, certainly at the legislature now and our lawmaking. But there are some times when private conversations and small groups working behind the scenes are necessary to really get down to the hard bargaining that is necessary for compromise to result in consensus and, and good results. And so the Groundwater Management Study Commission, which was originally created and had to do all of its business in, in public, was not a success. The rump group uh, was successful because the, the entities and people represented by the few people in the room trusted their leaders to make sound decisions. And those leaders did make sound decisions, not always voluntarily. But at the end of the day, it worked out OK. And so sometimes um, transparency can be the enemy of progress. I'm not arguing that we move away from it, but I would just ask you to consider the context as leaders and sometimes think about how it might be necessary to go out in the backyard and talk about it a little bit before you go back in the meeting and try to iron it out with everybody else. Second, the notion of consensus. Uh, water policy generally requires consensus because any one party, stakeholder, can probably stop the progress of all of the others. That isn't necessarily true but it frequently is. And so it's good news and bad news. It's hard as heck to get the consensus. But once you have it, you've got something very, very valuable because you can get your legislation passed, everybody can march forward together, and Arizona presents a view to the rest of the world as, a, as an object that can get its act together. So consensus is, is really critical, especially when you're dealing with, with water. But I would say for all of you as uh, leaders in the, in the state and certainly leaders in the future, uh, always it's better to derive a consensus if you can than to run over the top of somebody. It might be possible sometimes, but I've seen it in the legislative process. It never fails. You take advantage of power rather than persuasion. Uh, in the long run, you end up making bad policy and you have to go back and do it all over. Uh, third, and this relates a little bit to what I just said, is the matter of compromise. As I said, I, I felt kind of bruised after this process because I didn't think uh, my folks had come out as well as I would have liked. Uh, but I've learned something in the United States Senate. First of all, the Senator represents all the people of Arizona. Now, if I put a question to all of you, I would bet you no matter what the question is, there would not be a consensus in the room. So tell me how I'm supposed to vote. Who am I supposed to pay attention to? You have to be attuned to what everybody thinks and try to get the arguments right and then make your best judgment and, and cast a vote. But you also have to recognize that the people on the other side have done the same thing and maybe you have 55% of the votes and they've got 45%. So maybe they deserve something more than zero out of the deal. And I will say in the Senate, as opposed to the House of Representatives, by our rules, you really need to try to reach consensus or at least negotiate and settle us to most issues. And that's fairer in a way to the minority. So even if you're in the majority, be willing to compromise. Sometimes it's the only way to get anything. Sometimes a pretty good deal is better than no deal at all. And secondly, the other side might have something coming too. And so be willing to think about compromises that can get to a, a good result. Uh, I, I see in retrospect, as I said, that the compromises made and those tough negotiations in the rump group turned out to be pretty good public policy. And then finally, the matter of certainty. Like the Salt River project before it, the Central Arizona project, combined with the groundwater management, <coughs> has really endowed the active management areas with what? Water certainty. And if that's one thing that investors People wanting to come out to Arizona, 
people that have some stake in our future want is certainty. It's the knowledge that things are settled and not unsettled. That they're not going to have rights taken away from them when they come out. And that's why it's important to get uh, results like this. It gives developers and, and investors and others assurance that there's a sufficient water supply for whatever they want to do. In fact, I wanted to make a note on the Kyle Water Center recently did a survey and issued a report. Uh, and I think it was called the price of uncertainty. And so the, the price of uncertainty, well, um, the price of uncertainty is people don't put their money in the state to develop. That's the bottom line. And this survey found that developers are strongly positive about the assured water supply requirement because it provides this standard of certainty for the future and that they need in order to get the return on their investment. So, for almost 40 years, this water certainty has fueled development in the state. According to the W.P. Carey School study from uh, the day of the first delivery in 1985 of CAP water to the year 2010, the CAP water supply cumulatively, cumulatively generated over a trillion dollars in gross state product. Think about it. That about <coughs> one fourth of uh, the gross state product of the state. We may be at the beginning of a new chapter of Arizona's water story as we discuss the drought conditions that caused us to have to get together again. Uh, maybe the assumption that's prudent is that we have a new normal now, which is this drought. Even if that's not the new normal, it's probably prudent to plan as if it were, at least with respect to our surface water supplies from the Colorado River. In the immediate future, we need to resolve how to live with impending reductions in supply. And in the long run, we're probably going to have to invest in new methods of stretching the current supplies to meet the demand. And in the end, probably we'll have to augment the supplies that we have. The longer we can, through reuse and conservation and, and uh, sound water management, um, put that day off, uh, the cheaper and the better technology will exist and we actually have to, have to uh, invest in it. So there are a lot of challenges before us here. And I would love to be an emerging leader like you all, thinking about these dawning challenges before the state, but with some appreciation of what people before you did and how they got there. So these are some lessons that you can learn in determining how to be good leaders for the future. And we're down to my benefit. I appreciate it very much, and I hope that you'll, you'll benefit from that. Always think of uh, one more step ahead when it comes to water problems, because we can look to our history of almost 40 years ago and see that history again being applied this year for guidance on how to achieve the water the certainty that we need in order to thrive. Good luck in all of your leadership endeavors and everything else that you do. Uh, and if I can ever be of any assistance to any of you, I'll certainly try to do my best. Thank you so much.